and queen takes f3. Oh, what is going wow. on? Oh, this is going to be a fortress. I just don't see any hopes at all. This is very easy. Just rook back and forth. Taking chess to the next level. Wow. Wow. Wow, yeah. Nothing else to say. Wow. Creating the future of the sport. Introducing the Champions Chess Tour. Ten months, ten tournaments. The world's best players online and on TV. Hello everyone, this is Grandmaster Lim Le. Today I am doing the show, my most memorable game in the Skilling Open. This is my last tournament in the Champions Chess Tour. And I'm going to show you my last round game against Grandmaster Ali Reza Firoza. So this game, I was black and it is a very memorable game to me because well, first of all, my opponent is a very strong and um, young player. And this is the last round, so he needed only a draw to qualify to the knockout stage. I needed to win, but even then, it wasn't clear if I would qualify or not, so I just wanted to try my best. And he started first with knight f3, knight f6, so kind of a slow approach, the ready opening. So there isn't much to say about the opening because it's like a very typical uh, positional struggle for both sides. And I think I wasn't sure during the game, I wasn't sure if it, he was trying to win or draw because if he wanted a draw, maybe it's, it's better to go with some uh, more forcing variations, especially with white just to force the tray of the pieces. Um, but maybe he just wanted to play a game, so he, he chose a, a normal opening. To me, it's, it's a perfect choice because the more pieces we keep on the board, the more chances I have uh, in creating some complications. So at this point, I was more or less okay with my, with my position after the opening. Obviously, white has a small advantage here with better developed pieces and uh, better center, but I wasn't too concerned about my position. So the next move is normal, rook fd1, just defending the d3 pawn and getting ready for ed or e5. So at this point, I probably should have taken on e4 like this and go 97 with the idea of rook e8, then c5. If bishop f1, I always have queen a5. So I could assume that white is a little bit better here, but not so much. Um, like he has better control of the center. He can put the knight to d4, put the pawn to f3 just to defend e4, and then maybe try some bishop f1 later on. So positionally, it is a little bit better for white because white pieces are more active. You can see the bishop can come back here and maybe get to this diagonal. Uh, black bishop here is kind of restricted by this part on e4. So um, also later on, white has some chances to play like f4, e5. Of course, Black will try to play counterplay in the center, maybe trade off some pieces, maybe play like c5, b5, but uh, it's just a different type of position. So in this position, I, I decided not to open up the d5 
So I play 9 bd7 and he took here, I took here, queen b3 to f8. So at this point, 95 is not good because I can take, take, and then maybe go knight c5 and I get back a pawn on d3. Um, but he could have played a move like knight e1, which would be very strong because now d5 is hanging and I don't think I can defend d5. So I may have to suck the pawn. For example, if I if I go like knight c5, you can take, take, knight d5. And although I have compensation here, I think it is only wise who can be better here. Maybe rook d2, defending f2, and okay, I have uh, bishop pair, good compensation, but it's hard to say that that is enough. Maybe I go like rook d7, but he has like knight f3 and try to play d4. So I could say this is slightly better for white. However, in the game, he didn't go for this one. He decided to play queen b5 on move 16. And this one, I believe, is a slight mistake from white because it really helps me to release the tension and trade off the queens. So now this game is interesting to me because from, from this point forward, I think I play a pretty much a perfect game um, in a practical sense. Like I play, I try to, although it looks very symmetrical, the pawn structure, um, both sides keep all the pieces here except the queens, but I, decide, I, I managed to create some complications, some unbalanced positions. So first of all, at this moment, my, my knight is pinned and I need to play this move g5. Otherwise it's, it can be unpleasant because I have no, no move for my pieces. White has very uh, easy ideas like Rook c1, knight d4, knight f5, and my pawn on d5 is a little bit weaker than his pawn on d3. So I decided to push g5. Well, the obvious threat is g4, but the um, the key thing is just to close this diagonal and release the pressure on on my knight of d7. So of course the drawback of g5 is that is that um, once you move the pawn forward, it cannot move backward and you may create some weaknesses in your position. But I think it was worth it to go with g5. So he continued with knight d4, I had to play g4, bishop. Now his bishop uh, went back to f1. Bishop g2, I think he did like because I have knight e5 or knight c5 and d3 is weak. So he played bishop f1, king g7 defend f6. So for, for a while, it seems the position is still very much equal. Well, here I don't want to just go back because then he played d4, bishop d3, and it's very hard to win that position. So I decided that I have to gain some space and play a little bit more aggressive. It looks like I'm, I, I, I sacked the pawn on d4. So after 94, I don't have an immediate threat, but I was planning to play maybe 95, attacking this uh, bishop. And if bishop goes back, then I have 95. If bishop doesn't go back, then I just take it and go like knight f6. So I think I could have very strong compensation here. So my opponent decided to bring the bishop back to g2. Now that my pawn is on d4, the bishop is quite active here on g2. So I went to knight c5, take, take. So this position is now kind of rawish here. Like after a series of exchange, 
I, I, I was pretty sure that it was very close to draw. But from this moment, my opponent kind of surprised me a little bit because he played passively. Um, first of all here, he didn't need to play F3. He could play a very uh, natural move like King F1 here. And the point is, if I go Bishop C7, he can take, take and bring the King to E2. And there's no way Black is gonna win this position. Rook C2, Rook D2 brings nothing for Black. And if not Rook C2, then White is just gonna go King D2 and Rook E1. And then Black's pawns may even become weak in the end game. So Rook C2, Rook D2, and then probably back and Rook D1. And it's just a draw here. But my opponent here, maybe he underestimated my chances in this position. My only, only um, advantage here is the space advantage. So my pieces have a little bit more uh, room to maneuver than his pieces. And the uh, D3 pawn is a weak one. So a move like H3 doesn't really solve his, his problem. So I went with h5, take, take. And on now trading up some pawns seems like a good strategy to simplify the position. It it actually helps me a little bit here. And at this moment, his decision to take on c7 was a big mistake. I would say that was the tipping point of the game because you can see with the bishop pair, it's, uh, both sides have weaknesses um, and targets to attack. For example, he can use this bishop to attack my pawn on d4. It's on the dark square. But once this, once he traded the dark square bishops, it's harder to attack my d4 pawn. At the same time, the d3 pawn is on a light square. So it's very easy for my bishop to attack this one. So after the trade of the dark square bishops, I am left with the good bishop the last square bishop versus a bad bishop for white because this bishop cannot attack any of my pawn. So this is a mistake. Instead of this bishop c7, I thought maybe he could play like king f3. And the idea is, okay, um, after the trade, white's king is very active here and he has this idea to go bishop f5 or bishop c8. And it would be a equal here. So after bishop c7, it was already very difficult for white. Although it may not look, um, it may look harmless here. It doesn't look like something too serious, but certainly there are some threats like rook c2 and then this pawn is also very weak. So he played rook b2 to defend the second rank. I bring my king. Now you see, I because I have a good bishop, I put all my, my pawns on dark squares, so his bishop cannot attack my pawn. So this is the key issue here for black because now I have so many, um, I have so much time to improve my position. Like, yeah, I just improve all the pieces um, to the ideal squares. So normally when you're pushing in positions like this, you don't rush, you just take your time to make sure that you improve everything. So that's the first step. I improve my bishop from h7 to get to a better square g4. My rook from c7 now is on e3, very active. And then it, I totally dominate the whole position here. The rook can go to e1 and b1 or a1. And his rook has to stay on, c, on b2 because if it goes to to c2, then I have rook d1, and then bishop f5, attack the d3 pawn. So he basically had to stay very passively. And again, I keep all my pawns on the dark square, so his bishop cannot attack. Then that is like step two. And then step three is to finally break through, because for now, it's still 
he has only one witness here. So the principle is to create a second witness and bring the last piece into the game. So my bishop and my rook are all very active already. So the last piece that I can use now is the king and the king is very important in end games. So I have to bring the king to the game, but where? So for now we can see that the g3 pawn control f4 and h4 so my king cannot cross over. Also my king cannot really go to the queen side. So the best way is to break through by f5, f4, trading off uh, a pair of pawn and get my king to f4. So I follow up with uh, this. And then eventually, yeah, white eventually run, run out of move because he had to prevent rook f1 and rook h2 at the same time here. So it wasn't possible anymore. F rook h2 is a big threat. So he had to play bishop x3 in order to control this. If rook h2 now king e1 forces the trade of the rooks, but bishop f3 allows rook f1 and now f4. So big problem now is that his bishop, um, if it goes to h5, then I go like rook h1, and then there are threats like, uh, like bishop f1, rook h5, and if this bishop moves from this diagonal, like bishop e4 here, then there are, there are threats like bishop g4 uh, eventually, not, not immediately. Um, so I, I started first with king g3. The idea is taking f2 into control and just moving the rook somewhere, give me the threat of bishop g4. So this is already winning for black here. And then yeah, here my opponent was like, if rook c2 here, then I just go rook c1 and there are no defense against bishop g4 and checkmate on b1. So maybe rook b1 is even more accurate. So my opponent played b4 and then here I played rook a1, but actually rook b1 was, would be much more accurate in winning on the spot. Again, the threat is bishop g4 or bishop f1. So white has to move the rook to a2, and then I can have this move bishop e6 attacking the rook. And white is losing a home rook because bishop because of uh, rook c2, bishop g4 leads to mate. So I play, I was low on time here, so I play rook a1, which allow rook b2. Um, but this was still a winning position for me, and I managed to win it um, without much difficulty at the end. So, yeah, just just some some little tactics that I have to calculate here and make sure that it worked in my favor. So, um, yeah, like rook, if I move the rook here, then he has rook d4. It wasn't so easy. So giving a check first is the most accurate way. And then a2. And now you see why I needed to bring my bishop to g4. The reason is now if king b2, I have rook b1. And if rook a4, this is the reason. I got the I got to trade the rooks. And now, yeah, this end game is totally lost for white, two pawns down. And I protected all my pawns. So we play a few more moves, but the results was um, never in doubt here. So I really like this game because um, I would say I play in Madness Castle style, try to squeeze from a completely equal position and manage to create my own chances. My opponent helped me a little bit, of course, with a few mistakes, but you wouldn't say that um, he made any big blunder. So like bishop c7 was a mistake, but it was a very natural move. It was like one of the moves you would make in this game. You probably could realize it was a mistake in a classical game, uh, but when you're low on time, you don't really realize that there are strategical ideas behind that. And 
Uh, the type of the position here, it looks very harmless for white at the beginning. Only Rook and Bishop and four pawns each side. One wouldn't think that one would have tremendous uh, issue in this in this end game, but he does. And and I'm proud that I slowly squeeze this position, um, create more and more practical problems for my opponents until he couldn't hone it anymore. So once in a while, I managed to play this this type of games and really nice to uh, to play them because you know it's it's uh, once you play like this type of games it's not like a very beautiful game when you just crush your opponents but slowly outplaying him um, showing your technique is something that uh, we all love to do um, so thank you all for watching my show today and i'll see you in half an hour when i will continue with my banter please